So Romania, for instance, Romania has been very harsh, you know, introducing EC uh, competition law all of a sudden, it has almost destroyed the economic system. So that was a big, a big, a big, a big problem. Now, however, we are here. So what do we do? We first of all acknowledge that there is a period of a crisis, but this crisis is not the first time. We have had the worst, think of the 1970s. No, 1970s, there was economic crisis, worse than now. You know, it was cold, there was no heating. There was Sundays without cars, not because it was ecological, but because we had enough oil. The crisis was much worse than this, much worse. Everybody was say, were saying, oh, the community is finished, it didn't. There are crises, it's, it's part of human life. Crisis is now, it's going to finish. Second, we need to work together. And, uh, and, and this is also on the part, part of countries like Poland, Poland more than the others, because whether you like it or not, you are a leader in this area. You know, this is a group of six big member states, Britain, France, Germany, Spain, Italy and Poland. So you are the leader here, so you, Poland brings responsibilities. So, say no when it's needed to be said no, but don't hide the lack of preparation, which you are mentioning under a no only, because this is going to hurt Poland, and it comes from your Italian experience. At a certain point, as I said, the king is, is, is naked, but he also hurt the, the rest, and we don't want the European Union to, to hold us, because we would be naked little, little countries in a world which is completely changing. We are insignificant at the worst stage, absolutely insignificant. And cultural explanation, there is and there is not, in the sense, as I said, it's, it's, it's the domestic defaults which explains, which explains the European, the European, uh, the, the European level. Uh, some are defaults are inherited. Major default in the public administration actually dates back to 1860 when the northern Piedmontese administration was modeled after the very efficient French one by Napoleon. And when they, when Italy was reunited in an unexpected way, again, it's, it's a problem of being reunited before the country was ready to it. It first of all incorporated the debt of southern Italy. So the, stars, uh, the country actually kicked off with a huge debt, which had to be paid, which didn't help. And we had this southern uh, inefficient papaline uh, bureaucracy and southern bureaucracy, which was completely different from the from a northern one. And, you know, we didn't want to be, it's a little bit like, it really reminds me of this story, you know, we didn't want to be, we didn't want to be, uh, aggressive on, on the new on the new Italians and you know we didn't work. so instead of changing the culture like they did in Germany in Germany they did change the culture of Eastern European countries of Eastern European numbers we incorporated this public laxism which a country still still pays you know there is now the discussion either whether we should move some of the ministries around Italy I strongly support this idea we we have to do something we have to do something to, to change public bureaucracy, or the country is going to sink. Mm -hmm. I, I was mentioning before that I've been working for the past one and a half years at the National School of Public Administration, and what I've seen has been highly demotivating me. Well done. Give a shit about Europe, they're not interested. I've been fighting to insert one week of European Union training within six months of training. Now the training has been reduced for the new uh, dirigent, the new of sections has been reduced to three months due to financial restrictions and European training has been reduced to six hours. The single market. I asked to do negotiations, simulation negotiations in English and French. I was not even able to explain this then woman who is in charge of training what a simulation is. She was like, oh, but we already do communication. I was like, forget. Simulation is not communication. It's something different. So, no communication. So, if we don't change our international, international our public rules, we, we're going nowhere. And from this point of view, I think the challenge is very similar, semi similar to, to yours. I mean, you have some very efficient people, but some very inefficient people and culture which comes from the past. And it will be hard to, 
to, to change, but we have to, for our good sake. So the problem with foreign service or with people dealing with European affairs is that they are more like you know islands of excellence. Uh, and they are quite disconnected from the rest of the ministry. Uh, they prepare uh, the Polish positions for uh, for the council, and it eventually it turns out that this is not the minister's position, even though they are well, formally in charge of preparing the draft. Uh, and quite many, well, majority of this first wave of uh, uh, European affairs experts moved to Brussels. We, we still can't uh, fill the Polish quota for, for, for the bureaucrats in Brussels, but uh, uh, this uh, 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 drain of uh, brains is, uh, uh, was tremendous for, for, for the uh, Polish uh, bureaucracy. So, uh, yeah, but we have exactly the same. We have had exactly the same situation where the foreign ministry has filled in a lack of. Uh, a, la a lack of expertise in the other ministries, but the problem, as you say, is that for accent it is this is still small, a small group of people, which eventually are self-referent because they don't, they're not in touch. Even if, for instance, in Italy now we have diplomatic attaché to each ministers, but diplomatic attachés are coming from outside the different ministries. So yeah, they have agreed, but to a certain point, uh, and they change. So. And, and also, is no, is no, if you know that the foreign ministry is filling in, there is no incentive for, for, other, for, for the, the bureaucracies to, to fill in. There is also a problem, I don't know if you have the same problem, but uh, public bureaucracy in Italy is very badly paid. And international experience doesn't pay off. So if people, of course, that's one of the way you can improve public bureaucracy is by sending people on ends. You know, on three years in Brussels and then they come back. But this means that one, the bureaucracies they come from are willing to pay for it because it means that they will still pay one person, which will be out. And in many in many cases, is uh, is like, oh, why should we invest in someone who's away? You know. Secondly, again, I don't know if this case in in, in, in in Poland, but this is definitely the case in Italy when they come back. Instead of being in Spain, in Portugal, when you come back after being on an end, you get a, an increase in salary, you get a, a jump in, in career, you go forward in career. In Italy, they hardly find their desk. So this is a way, I don't know, how, I really don't know how the situation is in Poland, but this is the way it can be. It can be. And in, in general, people are interested in going to Brussels because they know that they earn much more money, the problem is having them coming back where they know that they're earning less money and nobody's going to bother them and you know, that they're going to go back to a non-interesting job. So again, it goes back to how to incentivate public administration, how to keep the best people into the public administration, how to attract the best people in the public administration. And that's this unresolved problem which I think we do, we do share with, uh, either we do share with, with, with Poland and it's not a happy problem. There is some cooperation between the national school public administration within the two other, but it's not six people can know it. So it's that that's really a key a key problem in, in European affairs. Any questions or comments from you? Mm -hmm. Una 
semplificazione? Cosa ne pensi? Guardi, no, molto, molto spesso non ti dà. Yeah, sure. Sorry, she's asking about the interpretation of the supernatural of the trials of today. Very often I find myself dissenting with Lucio Baraccio, but in this case, he's right. I mean, what was Italy before the end of the Cold War is not thinkable today. To understand it, you have to think of what was Poland during communism and what is today. We had exactly, in different ways, the same change of shift. And in terms of wideness, it was huge. You know, I was a young Christian Democrat. I never said, I would still remember the day I set foot in 93, 94, for the first time in the Casa del Popolo, which was a recreational, a recreational uh, area of the, of the former communist. And it was, you know, ah, I set foot in the Casa del Popolo, something I would have never thought of living in my life. It was evil. Mm -hmm. You know, my best friend was a one of my best friends was a communist and we would fight like hell. And he became eventually an American citizen. And we are still laughing. Because for him, everything, America was America with a K. I was talking to a friend of mine, where he was at the time, I was responsible for international affairs of the Anderson Democrats. And he was responsible for international affairs of the young communists. And he was a bright, bright, bright guy. And he now lives, I've been living for a long time in London, and we were talking about it. We were talking uh, a few days ago, and it's like, you know, sometimes my, my, my wife says we should go to the US, but you know, for me, it would be psychologically too much <laughs> to go to live in the US. You know, it, we didn't have a former wall, but we did have it in reality. If you look at the map of Italy, it's, if you look at the center, left uh, of the northeast, you'll see there is one railway, one high point north. One highway going north, one railway going east, one highway going east. Point, which are extremely underdeveloped, and in fact, they're still while the uh, while the fast trains are all over from Turin to Milan to, to, to Rome to Naples, that part is still in, in left over. Why? Because you had bus under the bridges. Because the idea was that if an invasion would come from east from Yugoslavia, we would bomb the bridges and stop the invasion. That is where Italy lived until 1989. And the, the contrast was so strong. So strong. I mean, don't forget that we had a prime minister, Aldo Moro, which was killed, yeah. brutally kidnapped and killed, possibly with the help of the United States, because he wanted to create a government of public unity with the communists to overcome the period of terrorism. He was killed because of that. And after him, the project collapsed. So it's, it, it was a very, very hard divide. And, uh, and each side, the US is on one side, and the Americans on the other side, did everything they could to increase this divide. You know, they were, if both of them had money getting into the system, both of them would take the brightest people on each side and bring them either to the United States or to Russia and, 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 and come back. And uh, in, in the communist families, you learned Russian. In the anti-communists, you learned English. It was huge. Huge. My the con of course, the first time the democracy and we got Yeah, of course, because there, there was a, a, a political system which was, from a formal point of view, democratic, in the sense that it would fit the minimum definition of, uh, of democracy, that is, free competitive elections, free media, and more than one party. So it did fulfill the minimum definition of democracy. But from a substantial point of view, it was more a, a unfinished democracy. It blocked a blocked democracy in the sense that there was no option, since the Gaspari went to the US right after World War II, no options for the communists to be in power in national government. So it would always be the same five parties, which with the communist party, 30% and 10% with the for, for former faces, you needed to have a coalition to survive. And in change, they would get a leading role in the parliament, in the Yorki, for instance, has been a leader of the, of the parliament. Uh, they could win and rule at the regional level. My region, this region, are actually cases of accidents which are ruled by the Communist Party for a long time. 
and and the liberal republican christian democrats and socialists would have uh, would have uh, a predominance in the banking system in the industrial system the, the, corporate, the communists would have a predominance in the in the cultural system <coughs> including universities and in the and the judicial system and we are still paying for that we are still paying for that and uh, and that's also explain why Berlusconi, despite everything, is still so popular. Not because he said, oh, we're going to be invaded by the communists, nobody believes that anymore. But because when he says that, you know, there is a persecution by the, the judges, uh -huh. you know, he's an easy target, he's like firing on the Red Cross. But it's true that while everything he does goes under the media, Bassolino, which is equally under process for corruption in Naples, Nobody talks about that. Anybody in the Christian Democrats and the Socialists have had some friends, relatives, whatever, which was completely disgraced, and trust me, completely disgraced during the Tangentopoli period. And the communists were untouched, former communists, because the magistrates were all leftish. Yeah. So, and, and this is, you know, when you feel it on your. And, you know, it was the new of two days ago that, that the, some of the major. The mafia people were were let out of the prison because the Corte di Cassazione didn't decide on them. They had five years, and in five years they didn't have time to examine their case. So, in the end, people say, "Oh, the guy is disgusting," but in the end, the man is like, "Yeah, oh, it's not so wrong." And this is really this is why I'm saying Italy will only change when all the people which were actors. In the first and the second republic, which in many cases is the same people, would be gone. Former communists, former fascists, former socialists, and former some former Christian Democrats that have to Christian Democrats have to disappear. I mean, all these over sixty years old or over fifty years old, anybody who was a major part in politics during the Cold War has to go. The younger generation is different. I'm borderline. You know, I lived in the Cold War, but I was young, and together with the, with the former communist, we, you know, we fight for the olive tree, so we have a sort of a common history, and we don't see the difference. But, but for instance, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is collapsed. The last elections were not, were clearly the, the regional election, clearly the, a loss of Berlusconi, but it was not the win of the Democratic Party either. The Democratic Party has major difficulties because it's basically a form of Christian Democrats and, and former and former uh, and former communists, and they distrust each other at the end of the day. So all these people have to go. When all these people will, will be gone, probably when Berlusconi, because the moment Berlusconi collapses, all these people which are just existing because they are against Berlusconi will collapse as well. Then we'll have the so-called third republic, and then Italy can Italy can can start all over again. The sooner the better. But you know, gerontocracy is a major problem in Italy, and yeah. it will take a while. So on the whole, as I understand, you count on biological changes rather than political. Sooner or later, I right. pay you. Dying <laughs> out of dinosaurs. No, uh, I shouldn't say that. But no. when the plane crashed. You know, that is very harsh, but when the plane crashed, the Polish plane, I, my first thought was like, God, we're so lucky. <laughs> you know, we, we need 10 of those planes in Italy to change the system. I know it's harsh, but this is how bad the situation it is. It is not necessarily harsh, but it might be not true. The question is that you are trying to say uh, something about yes and no countries. Now, when you say about Poland saying no, you have in mind those two years of uh, Kaczynski's rule, or you're saying about next few years of the um, present government? You know, the Kaczynski rule did as bad for Poland as the Berlusconi rule, that rule does, in, 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 to, does to Italy in terms of international image. So it's, uh, it's it will take a while before this image of no, no, no 
will be will be changed. You know, people are now waiting to see whether Poland will actually change. And it's not only the Kaczynski, because if you think about Nice, Nice, if uh, if uh, if Spain didn't have the support of of, of, Nor of of Poland on the back, they would have never had the political force to oppose to 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 negotiate in Nice. Right. And so it's it's long history of no 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 and overstress on national interest which you have, which reached the peak with with the Kaczynski because the Kaczynski like like Berlusconi are also folkloristic in a way. So they catch the eye of the press, better the eye of the press. I mean we are in a system where we're talking about twenty seven different national systems. And people hardly know where the capitals of different countries are. So if you have leaders which are somehow folkloristic, they catch the eye of the media. And they catch imaginary at, at the European level. So they so they were at the peak, but it will take a while before and it will have before this. I, I know that the situation is much improved. But it will take a while before the people just like we did and people don't don't trust because they know that we can change position very easily or as we did in the past, most than to, more than today. With Poland people for a while still won't trust because they are afraid that they will block a negotiation at the last minute. Mm, yes. It, when you talk about the national interest, these are the um, EU interest, if there is something like that. Uh, the question is how to find a balance, or strike a balance, because um, in many cases you, you, you can see that um, um, a sort of negative position um, can, in a sense, force those uh, superpowers within the EU to change their policies. But sometimes we have this feeling that saying yes, in fact, we are losing uh, our national interests. Now, one part of responsibility is here with the press. Because European negotiations are boring and so technical, and, and they need to be simplified, sometimes the press attacks me or can attack ministers because they said yes, and ministers are like, ah, better not say yes, because then the press will attack. So a part, a part is, is there. You know, how to find the balance is just like in a family, or in a marriage. We have common interests, common ideas, and differences. And it's part of daily negotiation, it's part of, of mutual understanding, <laughs> in part of thinking, you know, on these issues I could really give up, and these is others I want. I mean, it is not a it's it's not a zero sum it's not a zero sum game. I mean it's not that you in anything there will be a part of loss and part of 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 of, 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 of gain. But first of all a country always have to think of how much it's gaining for being part of the EU. You know, the British which were against the European Union, when it came to the time of voting on the referendum, whether they would want to be in the European Union or not, they did vote yes, yes. because they're very pragmatic. So overall, the fact of being part of the European Union gives stability, gives access to a wider market without duties, uh, gives mobility. I mean, I didn't have to show my passport to come over here from Germany to from Germany here. When I was when I was a, an Erasmus student, I had to pass to show my passport all the time, and uh, it gives the possibility to defend our foreign policy in given times. You know that's especially especially for for small and medium countries. But sometimes there are issues which would be completely lost without being part of the Union. I like give you one example: Portugal with this more. Mm -hmm. You know, Portugal was East, was able to do a lot of work in East Timor because he had the European Union on its back. And this just when I, the first example has come to my mind. So there is a general, there must be a general understanding that the European Union we are benefiting from being member. If this interest is not there, if the government feels that there is not such belief, then it should be fair. Take a referendum, ask the people to vote. But once they have voted, they have voted. 
and it's either in or it's all out. So it's in, it's in with understanding that you are gaining, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And sometimes a country has to give up on specific interest. There will be cases in which we negotiate to the last bit, olive oil. You know, olive oil for Italy is it is a, is a for South and Central East and South and Italy is a matter of, of, of life or death. Yeah. Uh, tomatoes, ripe tomatoes for Spain. So I'm not saying that we should not negotiate tough, but any person who knows something about negotiation should know at a certain point we have to wake up. And for a heavy win-win situation, everybody has to give up something. And also there are, there are what we will come, uh, call forced trading negotiations. There are a number of issues in which a country does not have any interest. So why, so why not giving it in? Or has a relative interest? Why not giving in on that and then gaining on the... It's on other... <coughs> it's, like, it's like when you are a mother and you have a son, you know. Until you don't have a son, you have all the time of the world and you can do whatever you want. At a certain point, you have, a, you have children and you automatically learn to prioritize what is good, what, what is really important and what is not. And that is what should be done within the European Union. The member states should understand what is really important for us, what is completely unimportant and what is middle important. And, and negotiate accordingly. If you, if you, we're all stuck. We negotiate nowhere. We go nowhere. Okay, then and the general question: um, What kind of future, political future for the EU, you would see as something which is feasible? There is all this discussion about the federal state, centralized kind of um, European state and the federation of national states. So you've got several options, and which one do you think uh, fits better national interests? Look, my next, one of my next book projects, which is supposed to come out sometimes next year, it's a handbook on the European Union, done for Rubens Press, same editor. Mm -hmm. Comparing or relevant with the with the with the US. Now, after being living almost four years in the US, there is one thing which is clear to me: is that all what the Europeans are saying about the fact that we don't we are decisions are difficult to be taken and blah 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 because the institutional system is complicated because we have differences blah blah blah. We should be like the United States. It's bullshit. If you look at the American system, the institutional system, the political system is so damn complicated that we are babies as compared. The differences between the states are huge. You know, as mentioned in the lunch, you know, yeah. California has a huge public deficit and other states are rich. So, we can live together even if we are different. Even if we have different political, different composition, different political choices, different political colors, and the institutional system is, is difficult. Now, the crisis clearly showed what? Clearly showed that on one side we were protected by the existence of the European Union and of the European Economic uh, of the European Economic Monetary Union. On the other side, you can't have different what the Germans thought. Uh, the system, as it was thought, is good for a period of economic growth. It's not thought for a period of recession. Now, in recession, you have two possibilities: about to evaluate the country or trade public deficit in order to inject money into the system. Okay? The Americans have decided to do Keynesian policies, which is to say injected the the, 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 country, the, the the currency a little bit, and they injected money in a Keynesian way. And now they will pay for it. They will pay for it, but they're starting again. They're starting again. I mean they've done it they've, they've done it twenty so, so probably probably when we're Thinking about that, we are discussing. I mean, discussion is going on currently. It's already started, and it would be hard with the Germans. You have to rethink some of the mechanism of economic monetary union in order to make it more political. Not too political, because the Germans would be very scared. But it can't be that rigid. So, problem. So, the, the answer is, is it's easy. We need to have a more political union. 
It's not the technocratic issues that the Germans would, would think. It's a very political issue. I mean, the Italian foreign minister has proposed European bonds. I think this is a very good idea. I think they would do, would, would do well on the market to, to finance a certain infrastructure to finance. So it's, uh, I, I don't see a step back as a solution. I only see a step forward as a solution. And historically, this is what has happened. In period of crisis, we relaunched by a step forward. Step forward is always what, and as we said before, as we said during lunch, the Americans have learned the hard way that differences, you know, differences should not, should not lead, lead to this union because they had a civil war. We have had a civil war with World War I and World War II, we don't want to, to have it again. We don't want to have it again. I mean, we are, my generation, your generation, we are very lucky because we are European. Sì, però allo stesso tempo di nuovo mi dispiace che faccio una domanda no. solo che sono in inglese per tutta in Italia, perché in Italia non sono in Italia. Quindi lei sempre crede che bisogna andare verso la federazione del mio, cioè la federazione europea, come lo dice anche il titolo del, del libro di Ercoles, un giornalista, non so se lo conosce, Ercoles, un giornalista genovese, ha scritto recentemente un libro su, con questo titolo, oltre a me. Cioè, o eh, facciamo federazione europea o altrimenti l'Europa questa qua vede il suicidio. Però allo stesso tempo le riviste tipo geopolitica, Linux, eccetera, eh, mostrano i dati eh, secondo i quali tra 20-30 anni eh, eh, la percentuale del capitale europeo sarà sul 5%. Quindi eh, se effettivamente abbiamo ancora sem sempre questa forza di non so come dire, la nazione, cioè non la nazione, la società europea sta invecchiando, stiamo diminuendo il nostro potenziale, quindi se effettivamente abbiamo ancora tutti questi strumenti da usare per creare una, una struttura forte nell'arco nell From many points of view, we are more affiliated than the US. From many points of view. From other points of view, we are less federated. It's what, what is lacking is yes, some some reforms to make this problem, some reforms to make the system the system better. But after all, with the current decision procedure, we are very near to a bicameral system. What is lacking is not the institution, it's the understanding that we are together. And the will. I mean, this is the major difference. It's not as I said. If, if, if you look at co-decision, for instance, which is how 70% of our national law are decided, you have two chambers with exactly equal powers today. The parliament and the council has exactly the same powers. And they can rule over right each other. So more federal than, and, the, and the outcome, which is EC law, replaces European law, replaces national law. So from the decision-making point of view, we are, we are a, a federal system. Central bank, common frontiers, if this is not a federation, what is that? And uh, you, know, you know that in the US, if you pass your bar exam in New York, and then you move to, to, to California, you have to take the bar exam once again. You know, we are more, or if you move from Washington DC to Virginia, which is two miles away, you have to do it to change your license. So from many points of view, we're more, we're, we're more advanced we manage. The problem is that, especially at the political level, the narrative is more of a conflict and difficulties. But my son is going to school in the US. He's five and a half. And it's amazing how the sense of a nation, the sense of a common future, the sense of common wellness is transmitted since they're very young. I mean, we have to understand that we are old continent, that we're facing major challenges, energy for one. How do you think we're going to solve the energy problem if you don't work together? I mean, clearly, we have to invest in research. We, I mean, in, and the decision of Germany to close the nuclear bases, 
but the atomic basis will, will have an impact. And we have to do it together. You go to the European political science associations and you find it's like 200 people. You go to the APSA and it's like 5,000 people. You know, we, we have to understand that we are together. Brazil, India, China, they have had enough of their past. They're going to eat us. The US is not interested in Europe anymore. It's interested in, you know, getting what it needs from this or that country, and we're stupid enough to, to knee every time they sneeze. Now, our future is together. So more than institutions, we need a narrative. We need an idea. And the British, which are very good at that, is what they're called. If you look, what is missing from the Lisbon Treaty as compared to the, to the Constitutional Treaty? It's not the decision-making. Actually, the decision-making which exit from the post-Lisbon, post post-Constitutional uh, Treaty, which was eventually sacked by the French, by the French and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Dutch, is more, ad the current treaty is more advanced than that. It retook almost, almost everything that the Constitutional Treaty had put it together. What is lacking? A European Union. A European, an official European flag, constitutional flag. The, 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 the high representative is not called foreign minister. The Brit opposed to the symbols, not to the institutions. Because they know, because they're good at that, because they still have a common, because they know that symbols is what creates unity. Symbol and narrative. It's not the problem of institutions. Institutions are there. It's a problem of head. Are we there with our heads or not? My feeling and my hope is that there is younger generation which is increasingly becoming European. You know, we're talking again a lot. The first Erasmus, wow, you are again, you're going away. The first international marriages, ooh, wow, how are you going to do it? Now it's normal. More and more people, we travel, we study, as scholars, we are in a particular happy position because we can, I think one of the wonderful things about being a scholar today is that you can live in different countries. So, again, there will be a generation change, hopefully, if the old generation that has destroyed everything before. But there is a European generation, whether people like it or not. It's like European diplomacy. Now the member states are fighting, are fighting like hell. It's ridiculous. Now, two years they started, they started recruiting European diplomats from scratch. And when national diplomats have, will have spent eight years in European institutions, they will be more European than national. Our foreign ministry, the Secretary General, was furiously against the, the, the European, uh, European, uh, European uh, Foreign Service because he knew that sending young diplomats for eight years, or in Brussels, one abroad, would, be, would mean losing them to the cause. And what is the cause? Obedience. <sighs> Looking like this. Eight years, we are transformed. So he fought it. Then at a certain point, they, they found out that Ops were doing a total disaster. And they had to recuperate. It's going to come. It's, it's, it's in the facts. And, and when the old national politicians will be finally gone, it will be in the facts. You know, again, look at the American history. The US were not done in, in one day. The rivalities were very strong among the member states. Virginia went off of negotiations, and they had the two constitutions first, and they were newborn states. We are united out of, of hundreds of history. But remember, before the, before, the, uh, sorry, God, uh, before the end of the Cold War, of the, of the Thirty Years' War, Europe was what it is today, a free space where people circulated. Absolutely. So we have had a gap of 500 years. But what is 500 years as compared to 2,000 years of story? Yes, but the second of the question is this thing that can be very difficult. Ci sono gli scienziati che dicono che andiamo verso qualcosa di tipo nuovo, nuova forma di me o di course, perché Caraccio è una major figure in Italy, nobody 
bothers about him abroad. You know, I will respond you with a, with an Italian, I will excuse the Italian, we'll translate it. There was an Italian yes, so politician, there was oh, an Italian I politician. Know. You know, like there was this national politician in Italy, and uh, he was a national politician, a member of the European Parliament. And each time he had to go to Strasbourg, each month was like, Did you please come with me? And it's like, I, I knew exactly what he meant by going with him. And I said, Of course, no, I'm not coming with you. And one day he said, Federico, che vada a Strasburgo, non mi sapete di pezza. Said, what am I doing in why am I going to Brussels? Nobody uh, to Strasbourg, nobody bothers about me. You know, it's easier, it's like in the press, it's easier to write against than to write in favor. It's easier to be polemic, especially if you're a man. Women is different. We are expected to be more conciliatory, but you know, if Caracciolo was not always against something, nobody would bother about him. And trust me, Limes, people driving for Limes, mm. not exactly what they would describe, describe the best analyst in Italy. We have. Which one would you suggest? Huh? Uh, which one? Uh, if not uh, Limes, which one would you suggest in a form of. Um, of source? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a tough question, because I like very much what they're doing at ESP, in Milan, for instance. I like less what they do at EI, much less. I think ESP is far more serious. There are a few centers in, in Turin, with the World uh, Institute, whatever it's called now, by Giovanni Lorgino, which is, which is doing good work. And that is one of the problems with Italy is that uh, different from the Saxon world, we don't really have an interchange between academia and uh, or think tank and government. And that's one of the problems. Because when you are in academia or in a, in a think tank, you are supposed to study. And then when you're in government, you don't have a time to study, unless you wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Mm. And, uh, but then, so you, you, are, you do action, but then you're going back to reflect on what you've done. We don't really have that. And actually, those who do it, like I would be, are strongly penalized in, in academia for a number of reasons. You still live, as you see. And you still live well, but uh, the system is sort of resistant. So I would say, yeah, look, look at what the is doing, what they're doing in Turin. They're doing some good things. And there is, you know, Sonia Lupe in Bologna. There is a Catania on humanitarian policy. There is us on the foreign policy, the foreign policy of the European Union, on Italy. And uh, there, but Limes does not represent Italy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, ooh, but it doesn't even have to be in the world. And they're very, very self referent people, right? Mm -hmm. But there is good analysis. There, you know, at the end of the day, we have, what, 10 people working on Italian foreign policy, on the Italian foreign policy. We're not a Carbone in, uh, in, in Scotland. And, uh, so it's, it's few of us. It's really few of us. So it's not so difficult to get trapped. Siena for the national institutions. Any more questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank that you was for a pleasure. Your questions thank you for and comments. Yeah, thank you so much.